Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone today. Those that are tuning in Facebook and YouTube, we're grateful also. Uh, another beautiful day the Lord's given to us, but I have to say one thing, the humidity is up, right? So we always got to complain about the weather, but really we should. God's provided it, and so we shouldn't be complaining. But I am grateful for this day. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for humidity. Some days we don't like it, but you have a purpose for it. Maybe we don't always understand that, but Lord, we thank you that you've given us a day that we can gather, a day that we can open your word. Lord, these are great blessings, and may we never take them for granted. Thank you, Lord, for your love and mercy for us. Lord, that just strengthens us each and every day. Lord, we praise you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. God's people said. Amen. Amen. All right, well, we're going to be in the book of 2 Peter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. And while you're turning there, just want to remind you of some things that are upcoming. Uh, we have our uh, graduate recognition Sunday. Uh, it's going to be uh, the 16th. And so be in prayer uh, for that. But also, uh, if you know someone that's going to graduate, you've got a family member, please get that information in so that we can recognize them uh, that day. Uh, this uh, coming weekend, uh, on, starting on Sunday, is the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, it's meeting in Indianapolis. And so that's taking place. Well, actually, June 9th is the pastor's conference. And then the actual convention starts on that Tuesday, next Tuesday. So be in prayer for the Southern Baptist Convention. Several important things will be discussed and considered. I'm sure it will make the news at some point. You know, typically it does. They, they want to uh, uh, critique what the convention's doing sometimes. But uh, be in prayer for that. Uh, Lou Ann and myself will be going to the convention. Uh, so uh, just, again, please be in prayer. Uh, Shrimp Southampton Roads Mission Project that's right around the corner. Uh, they're they're getting excited about it. Sounds like they've got a pretty large team that's going to be uh, involved. I was on a Zoom call last night uh, with the, the leadership of that, and so just be in prayer. But if you want to help, uh, they still need help, like in the kitchen. Uh, and maybe if you can't do it every day, or you can just do a breakfast or a lunch or supper, uh, please let me know. There are uh, volunteer registration forms uh, that you would need to fill out for that. But be in prayer you know, for the Southampton Roads Mission Project. And then finally, be, continue to be in prayer for our vacation Bible school. We had a good meeting the other night where we uh, were presented with the material, the theme, uh, went through the schedules, all that kind of stuff. Grateful for each volunteer who has already committed and stepped up. We are grateful for that, but we could always use more. So be in prayer. Uh, for our vacation Bible school, which will be in July, uh, beginning July 14th. All right, so as we uh, look at the Word of God here in 2 Peter, uh, we're going to consider what it means to, to be growing in the faith. Uh, obviously, one of the things that humidity does, we were talking about that, it causes plants to grow. <laughs> Certain plants, some plants don't like it. And the plants that like it, boy, they, they do well. Uh, so we see uh, how God has made it so that uh, plants, animals, us as human beings, we're designed to, to grow. I mean, we don't start out fully grown. The only two that did that were Adam and Eve. Uh, after that, we all start out as what? Babies, right? And we what? Are expected to grow. And so if you use that analogy in the spiritual life, when we are born again, we are what? Spiritual babes. Does that mean we know everything we need to know? Does that mean we do everything we're supposed to do? Do we even know how to do those things? No, we don't. We need to be taught. We need to be encouraged. We need to what, grow spiritually. And unfortunately, many times people will make a profession of faith and they'll think, oh, that's it. I don't have to grow. I don't have to do anything else. I said this prayer. I got baptized, I'm not going to hell, and so I don't have to do anything else. And here's the thing, if you have been saved and you're baptized, your desire would be to continue to grow. If it was a genuine profession, if it was a genuine uh, walk of faith and decision. And so Peter is going to remind his readers and he's reminding us uh, that we're to pursue this. We're to pursue spiritual growth. And then he gives some 
uh, uh, trail marks, so to speak. Like if you're going on a trail or something, there'll be marks along the way that kind of tell you you're on the right way. Well, in a sense, he's putting that out for us, mileposts, so to speak. He's putting this out to lead us. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, he says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So right there, it starts with faith. What faith in just faith or, or faith in someone? No, faith in someone whose name is Jesus. Trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior. So as we add faith, as we begin this journey in faith, he says what? Add to your faith virtue. And virtue is a word that's kind of falling out of favor in our culture and time. People don't care about virtue, uh, wholesomeness, you know, goodness, those kinds of things. In fact, the things that are being celebrated are things that are not very virtuous, are they? The things that are being upheld as the, the new standard are not that. But he's saying, with all, all diligence, add to your virtue, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. And so he's talking about your demeanor, your attitude. But guess what? You need to have some knowledge. How do we acquire knowledge? How do we acquire knowledge of God? I mean, how do we acquire knowledge just in general? What? You have to either read a book, someone's got to tell you, you got to see it, or you got to meditate through it and think through it. Those kind of, you know, he's saying we need to add knowledge. And where do we add knowledge to our faith and to our virtue? The Word of God. I mean, we, we read the word and it instructs us and teaches us to add to your virtue knowledge. But you know what? Just having knowledge and just knowing a bunch of Bible facts is not just is, is enough. It's a good foundation. Isn't it amazing that in Jesus' day, he encountered these Pharisees who knew the Old Testament scripture and could memorize it and could speak it and, and knew it all verse all the way down, and yet they missed Jesus as the Messiah. All that the Old Testament was pointing to was pointing to Jesus, and they knew all those words. They had all that knowledge, but guess what? Their knowledge was not enough. And in fact, who knows the Scripture better than all of us? Satan. Didn't he try to use Scripture to trip up Jesus? Didn't he try to misquote Scripture? He does. He, he has knowledge, but it's not a knowledge that is a saving knowledge. It's not a knowledge that contributes to virtue. It's not a knowledge that uh, will allow someone to grow in the faith. So he says, what? Add to your virtue knowledge and to knowledge what? Self-control. Self-control means you, you understand what God has, has done. You understand how to behave. One of the aspects of self-control is what to control your tongue. You know, James chapter 3 has a lot to say about that. You know, not just speaking what comes into your mind just because you thought it means you think you should say it. No, self-control says, no, let me think before I speak. Let me think before. I may have all this knowledge, but let me think. Let me be under control. To self-control, perseverance, which means what? Continuing in the faith, meaning uh, pushing uh, forward uh, with patience in that sense, to perseverance and <clears throat> godliness. Again, this is behavior outwardly. To see that we're living in a godly manner. To godliness, brotherly kindness. You know, some people can be doing all the things that pertain to godliness. You know, going to church, praying, even giving money. But you know what? They're some of the most unkind people. Why? Because they're judgmental. And he's saying, don't, don't just go through those motions. He says, what? Add to your godliness, what? Brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. And see, here's the whole thing he's pointing toward this. Faith in Christ should lead us to love more. And he's giving you a step-by-step -step way of what? The ultimate goal is to what? Love God. Love one another, love our neighbor, right? He, it's doing it, and it's a step-by-step -step process. It's a way that we what are to grow in the faith. He says, for if these things are yours and abound, what things? 
if these things are yours, what? Faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness and love. If these things are yours, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you will not be unfruitful in the kingdom. You will be producing spiritual fruit. You're either going to be having works of the flesh or you're going to have spiritual fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to be walking, what, in obedience unto Him. What happens if you plant a tree that is supposed to be an apple tree? And you plant this apple tree and it grows the first season, no apples. You may say, okay, that's okay. They're not supposed to bear fruit in the first year. Second year, no fruit. And let's say you keep that apple tree for a long, long time and it never bears fruit. Well, now you as a person who's just having it maybe as an ornament in your yard, you may just let it continue to go on, right? Because no big deal. But if you're a farmer and your crop is to be apples, what do you do with an apple tree that's not producing any apples? Replace. What good is it? Replace. You replace it because it's using up the ground, right? You, and it's this concept here, again, Jesus uses these analogies, the scripture uses these same type of analogies that still compute today. Talking about you would, he says, you will not be barren. He says, what, you're going to produce fruit. You're going to have fruit in your life that looks like what was just described up there. You're going to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. He says, for, uh, he says, for if these things are yours and what abound, means they're, they're overflowing. It means don't just, do, don't just be kind once. Well, I was kind once. I know it was two decades ago. Do I have to be kind again? You know, it's, kind, it's a matter of our speaking, a matter of the way we are each and every day. Uh, we're to do this. It says, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. You know, if you're not walking in faith, if you're not walking in virtue, in knowledge, self-control, and perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, if you're not walking in these things, he's saying, guess what? You're forgetting what you were saved from. You're forgetting the great joy that should be in your heart because of what Christ has done for you, how he's cleansed you. He says you're letting that blindness take over again. You know, in our sins we were blind, right? But Christ comes and removes that so we can see the glory of the gospel. But when we don't live in this way, guess what? We begin to, our vision begins to get cloudy. And we don't see as we should for he who what lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. He says, you've forgotten your salvation is what he's saying. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. So he's saying, guess what? Make sure that you are uh, working out your salvation with fear and trembling as the Apostle Paul says in Philippians, to what work out your salvation. Now there's a difference between working out your salvation and working for your salvation. If you're working for your salvation, you'll do these kind of things thinking, if I'm good, God will accept me and I'll be saved. Whereas that's not how the gospel works. It's saying you can, the gospel says you're not good enough and you never will be. That's the good news in the sense that because of Christ, he cleanses us of all our sin. And now what? We have forgiveness. We can walk with him. And he's saying, make sure to make your what? Call and election sure. That, that you're really saved. That you will do these as a response to the grace of God. You will do these as a response to the call of God. To the election of God that we will respond in this way for his glory. He says, and you will what? Never stumble. He said, you won't, you won't lose your salvation. He says, you walk 
it's a testimony, it's evidence of his call and election in your life. He says, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's saying, this is how we know that we belong to the family of God. Our lifestyle should reflect that. And so that makes us wonder, you know, these people who make a profession of faith, but then they go on and just keep living and living like the world. And they have no desire for any godliness, no desire for virtue, no desire that, and they just kind of give it all lip service. Did they make a genuine profession of faith? Or was it just some emotional response? Ultimately, only God knows. But Peter has given us a warning here, given us a roadmap. He said, if you're in the faith, then guess what? You're going to want to grow. And when you're not growing, it's going to bother you. When you're, you're, you're not growing and progressing in the faith, it may, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you, hey, you know, you need to uh, get back on track here. You need to get right with the Lord, you know, just on a daily basis, trusting Him. And this is what is so um, beautiful about the gospel. You know, we are saved by faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. That's one of the things from the Protestant Reformation. There was the whole difference between the Protestants and the Catholics. <clears throat> the Catholics said it's your works contribute to your salvation. And the Protestants said, no, it's by grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. And when you think about that, but it's a faith alone, but it's not a faith <clears throat> that is alone. And here's what he's saying. Add what? Add to your faith these things because of your salvation, because of the goodness of God. So as we live in this world, this dark world, uh, as the church becomes less accepted by the culture, so to speak, it used to be a, an expectation in our culture that people would go to church. And in many ways, it was good for their business. You know, you didn't even really have to be saved, but you could go be part of a church, and that was respectable. Well, now you have people who will not go to church because they're afraid, oh, we'll be labeled as one of those uh, right-wing nuts or, or something like that, and it would look bad for my job if I go to church. And I think that's one reason you don't see as many people in church, and in some ways, that's a good thing. God's getting rid of the wheat and the tares. There's always been going to be wheat and there's always going to be tares. And pr praise the Lord. He, he knows who they are, right? He sees that. And so now at least people aren't pretending to be Christians to get along in the society, which is what you had for so long in our nation. You didn't really have to be a Christian to be part of a church. I mean, you could say all the right stuff and do all that and, yeah, do that. But you never demonstrated any of these things that Peter is talking about here. And so we live in a world that is, seems to be getting darker. But if we want to be a church that shines brightly, and I mentioned that this past Sunday, a church that shines brightly, we have to what? Love God, love one another, and love our neighbor. And how do we do that? How do we show the world that we belong to Jesus? Let's live like this. Let's produce spiritual fruit that he's talking about here and leave the results to God. I, I, I genuinely think people are hungry for the gospel. They just have never heard it. They've never seen it. They think that the gospel is what they're hearing about on the news or they think church is that, oh, oh church, oh, they just want your money. Oh, church, they're judgmental about people. Oh, church, they're going to keep me from having fun. I don't want to do any of that stuff that they're doing. Oh, they're, they're not going along with the culture. I, but they've just never really heard the good news of Christ. Because I think people are hungry for the gospel. And they just don't know it. But when they hear the gospel, they're going to respond. And so let's just pray that during shrimp, that people who are hungry for the gospel will hear it. Let's pray during our vacation Bible school that people who are hungry for the gospel will hear it and they'll accept and believe and trust Christ and walk in faith and begin to demonstrate just as 2 Peter lays out. 
And let us never forget the joy of our salvation. Let us never forget that so that we can, what, be a church that shines brightly. We can be a church that brings glory to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and, and praise you for this time. And Lord, we do live in a, a dark world. And sin has always been there from the time that Adam and Eve ate of that forbidden fruit. Sin has been in the world. And there have been different times and seasons when sin seems to prosper more than in others. But it's always been there. And Lord, sin has always been in the church too. Why? Because we're just sinners saved by grace. But Lord, I pray that we would take seriously this admonition from Peter to, Lord, add to our faith these godly characteristics and qualities. Lord, as evidence of your work in our life, not that we're trying to be accepted by you or to be do these things to get saved, that we would do these because we are saved. And that the world would see a difference in us. It would be drawn to you. Again, so many things in the world would paint a picture of Christianity in very negative light. But yet, Lord, if people stop and think about it, they want all the blessings that Christianity has brought to the world, but they don't want Christianity itself. And they think they can have all those blessings but it's a, it's a false, false hope, a false dream. They can only have those blessings in Christ, in Christ alone. So, Father, we thank you for your grace. We pray for our nation. Pray for our community. We pray for our church. That, Lord, we would share boldly the gospel and that people will hear and respond. And we pray this in Jesus' name. God's people say, amen. amen. Well, again, I appreciate y'all being here and those that tuned in. Appreciate that also. Uh, let's say our vision verse together. After that, let's, uh, we'll conclude this time and then we'll continue on in prayer. But let's say this. Declare His glory among the nations. We get to do this. So God bless y'all. Thank you.